is uh, Mother's Day, uh, Mothering Sunday, and um, our daughter uh, Natasha had the, we've got this cup. Don't know about you, but your your kitchen cupboards end up with cups. <laughs> <laughs> I hate cups. <laughs> They're all the wrong shape and size. You can't stack them on anything. You just can't. Anyway. Um, there's this one cup she's had for a couple of years. In fact, it's, it's faded uh, in the dishwasher now. It, said, it says, I'm a mum. What's your superpower? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And now, sadly, the mum bits uh, faded off with the dishwasher. But uh, I really like that. I'm a mum. What's your superpower? And we are very grateful for mums. Uh, today. For, actually, <clears throat> I was thinking about Natasha and uh, she had a party yesterday. She put a lot of effort into uh, making the uh, party a success for Elijah. She's absolutely shattered, um, as we all are. <laughs> um, but it, it just reminded me, actually, um, mums in particular, single mums, what a lot of hard work they put in to bringing their children up. And uh, we should be so grateful for the uh, young mums, older mums, the mums in this fellowship, uh, but the single mums in particular, who, uh, for whatever reason, um, but they just have to put so much time and effort, um, so demanding, uh, and yet it's so rewarding. Um, it really is a superpower being a mum, and uh, we honour mums today. But um, we're going to carry on with our theme of death and resurrection. Now that might seem a little bit off for mothering Sunday. Uh, perhaps it should have been a bit more light-hearted, or you know, a bit more reflective, and a bit more, you know. Uh, mum-centred, um, but actually I want to look at the Bible today in a way that's going to cover a subject that's difficult. It's difficult because it tackles <coughs> perhaps in part one of the big questions. You see, what would be a, a mum's biggest fear, do you think? I was thinking about this. What would be a mum's greatest <coughs> fear? Losing a child. Losing a child. And uh, I was talking briefly to Lisa this morning. I think in the celebration of Mother's Day, Mother and Sunday, we also need to remember uh, that some mums will be going through a lot of pain mm -hmm. at the children that they've lost. Uh, and... Perhaps part of their journey will be asking the question to God, why did you let my child die? Now that might seem really difficult to cover today. But as we think about this theme of death and resurrection, I think it's important that we start to tackle some of these difficult topics and not be afraid to look to scripture. Not that I think it gives complete answers, but I think it gives a re responses that help people wherever they're at in their journey of faith. And so I want us to look at some passages today. Hopefully you've got your Bibles, but I know Catherine's got uh, the scriptures up and ready. <clears throat> We're going to have a look um, at some scriptures today and hopefully we'll start to unpack a little bit uh, about this theme of uh, death and resurrection. We're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke first, Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 11 um, to 17. I wasn't going to use this passage today, 
But uh, actually, I just think it's, it's really good, really, uh, and it links in actually really well with what we've looked at the last couple of weeks, uh, over a couple of weeks ago. Let's read it first. So we're reading from the message version. It starts not long after that. Now, we'll come back to that after that in a minute. Okay? So not long after that. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jesus went to the village Nain. His disciples were with him. That's important, I think, to get context. His disciples were with him. We've already mentioned, uh, Mantis already mentioned about John. John, one of the disciples, must therefore have been with Jesus uh, on this occasion. But John doesn't record this event. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not here to give you answers. <laughs> but I hope that as you start to study the Bible, you'll start to ask these questions. So the disciples were with him, along with quite a large crowd. As they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession. A woman's only son was being carried out for burial. There is no doubt in this passage the child that we're looking at is dead. And the Bible tells us that the mother was a widow. Remember a couple of weeks ago we, uh, Mandy introduced the theme uh, looking at the widow of Zarephath with uh, Elijah. And again, just interesting that the Bible often has these threads that, that are very similar. And when we think about resurrection, we perhaps have thought that it's just the New Testament. But what we wanted to show over the last couple of weeks is that actually death and resurrection is very much part of the Old Testament. And it's not just the new. But there are similarities here. Because the, woman, the mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, and I like this translation, it says, his heart broke. The first translation I read, I can't remember which one it was, it says, Jesus felt sorry for her. It doesn't quite cut it. But the other, other translations really stress that when Jesus saw her, his heart broke. Now, I think this is really important to tackle this difficult question about uh, children dying and why would God allow that? <coughs> Because one of the things that people will level against God is that he doesn't care. Okay? How can God allow that to happen? He clearly doesn't care. But this passage stresses to the reader and it says to me, that it's exactly the opposite. That Jesus does care. And in fact, <clears throat> some of the commentaries would say that the disciples and the crowd were so busy walking, but it was Jesus that saw what was going on. It was Jesus that saw and perceived that this was a widow. This was a dead soul. And it says his heart broke. <coughs> Don't level and come to me and say that God doesn't care. Because scripture clearly shows us 
that we believe in a Jesus whose heart was broken. And he said to her, don't cry. <clears throat> now, you can read into that whatever you want. She's obviously going to be crying. Any of us that have suffered loss and death will be crying a lot. It's natural. But there is a suggestion here that Jesus could see beyond. And he could see beyond the tears. And he could see beyond the death. And he said, don't cry. We don't know how he said it. I'm sure there was, a, because it was Jesus, I am certain he would have said it in a way that was so comforting mm. and reassuring, full of hope. Don't cry. Mm. Then he went over and touched the coffin. The pallbearers stopped. He said, young man, I tell you, Get up. And then, just the gospel writer, I don't know how you'd write a story like this, really. <laughs> just in the next sentence, it says, the dead son sat up and began talking. Jesus presented him to his mother. <clears throat> now, it then says in the next verse, which I love, they all realised they were in a place of holy mystery. Mm. That translation is fantastic. Because in all this, as we tackle the subject of loss, death, suffering, there is an element to which it is a complete mystery. The Bible can give us some responses and possible answers, but ultimately, death, heaven, afterlife is and remains a mystery to us. It's a holy mystery. But just think for a minute, just think for a minute, that the widow suddenly, from crying her eyes out, and suddenly, the son pops his head up out of this open coffin. <laughs> I think, I don't know about you, I don't know how the Gospel writers would have just put this over, but I suppose just to do it simply, I think I would have turned white as a ghost myself and probably dropped down there. <laughs> I haven't seen anyone come back to life. I don't know about you. I think Isaac did, um, who we used to have links with in Nigeria. And I think, again, death and resurrection, it's a complete mystery. And so the response is they all realised that suddenly what was happening, they were in a place of holy mystery. That there was no words to explain it. They couldn't perhaps get their heads round it, it was just a complete mystery. <coughs> that God was at work among them. We've sung that today. And I am convinced that if things, miracles happened in this place, our response would be just the same. Let's not think we're too spiritual. I think our response would be <laughs> what? <laughs> Let me give you an example because he's not here today. What if Mike started speaking properly again? It would be. What? 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 <laughs> we would be. That would be our reaction, would it not? And then we'd fight. And then. We praise. And that's exactly what happens here. They were gobsmacked. They were like, what, what on earth has just happened? 
<coughs> they were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful. Yeah. Calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. What a story. You know, I was, I was thinking about resurrection. To me, if I saw someone raised back to life, that would clinch it for me. There would be no other debate to have. Jesus is real. If he can do that, and I've seen it, that's it. There is nothing else to discuss. And, and yet, and yet, it's just, that's it. Then it, it, the gospel writer then goes on to something else. And in fact, isn't it strange that John chooses not to write and recount that story? Because he must have been there. And in fact, John was at the next one we're going to have a look at, uh, 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 one in a minute. And yet his resurrection story is different. Strange. <clears throat> but I suppose if we were all seeing miracles here in Alford, our recollections would be different too. That story really reminds us, I think, the pain of loss. And it should show us too, it wasn't the widow that asked Jesus to perform the miracle. Jesus' heart was so broken by what he had seen, he did something straight away. Quite amazing. <clears throat> and it's a powerful short story that's only in Luke's Gospel. And yet it reminds us of the just the awesomeness of God, I think, when it comes to death and resurrection. Wow. It's such a big topic, it really is. Now let me go on to the, remember how we started, not long after that. What was the after that? So if we go back to Luke chapter 7 verse 1, this isn't a death and resurrection story, but I want to read it for a couple of reasons. So let's just read it first. When he, Jesus, finished speaking to the people, he entered Capernaum. A Roman captain there had a servant who was on his deathbed. He prized him highly and didn't want to lose him. When he heard Jesus was back, he sent leaders from, remember, he was a Roman. The Bible tells us that he sent leaders from the Jewish community asking him, Jesus, to come and heal his servant. They came to Jesus and urged him to do it, saying, he deserves this. He loves our people. He even built our meeting place. Remember that. Jesus went with them. When he was still quite far from the house, the captain sent friends to tell him, Master, you don't have to go to all this trouble. I'm not that good a person, you know. I'd be embarrassed for you to come to my house, even embarrassed to come to you in person. Just give the order and my servant will get well. I'm a man under orders. I also give orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes. Another, come, and he comes. My slave, do this, and he does it. The Bible then says, taken aback, 
Jesus addressed the accompanying crowd. I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know about God and how he works. When the messengers got back home, they found a servant up and well. Now it's not a death and resurrection story. The servant was on his deathbed. There's two things I want to bring out. Firstly, faith. As we'll see in the next uh, encounter with Jesus. Faith. As we journey through these difficult questions, faith has to provide a response and an answer. But my question to you is faith in what and faith in who? You see, it's quite amazing. Jesus was taken aback because this Roman captain uh, believed in Jesus enough to not only just send some people out to send a message, but say, look, you don't even have to come. Just say the word, and I believe it will happen. Wow, that's faith. And as we struggle, perhaps, on our journey, wherever you are right now, you might be really struggling with some things. Some things might not seem to be getting any answers at all, even as you look to, to Scripture. But I can say to you that faith in Jesus Christ will provide an answer somewhere along your journey. I'm certain of it. I'm convinced of it. In fact, that is my testimony after my father died um, end of last year. It was my faith that brought me through it. Kept my feet on the ground uh, through some difficult, well, difficult years, actually. Because you're not going to be dancing and singing around, you know, all the time. Um, there's time to mourn. There's a time to die. And but I can testify here today that it was, it's my faith but it's actually surprised me how I've responded to my dad's death. My mother's death might be a bit different. But, <laughs> <laughs> but my dad's death, because it had been years with, it, with, with the journey with the illness, um, but that faith was just like a sure foundation that uh, kept my feet on the ground. That's my testimony. And what, if you're going through something tough, <clears throat> I want to say, faith in Jesus Christ. Call out to him, go get him, find him out, see where he is, because Jesus will provide an answer to your difficult situation. Now, I want to look at one more uh, passage. <coughs> it's in Mark's Gospel. <coughs> so as you think of resurrection, death and resurrection in the New Testament, apart from Jesus, there's uh, three that come to mind uh, instantly, I think. One was the widow's son of name. <coughs> One is Lazarus, which we're going to look at next week. And the other one is Jairus' daughter. And uh, Jairus' daughter is actually in three of the Gospels. It's not in John, but it is in three, uh, the three other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. Again, as we'll see, John was there. So why did he not write this account? Interesting. Uh, so we're going to look at Mark's Gospel. I've just got to, Catherine will probably find it a bit quicker than me because I've got to just uh, go this route with my tablet. I don't know what she's not doing. Uh, 
uh, Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 22 to 43. <coughs> now, we're going to read a fairly long passage because in the three Gospels where Jairus' daughter's uh, story is told, it is always interspersed with another story, which you will probably know. So let's read. Mark chapter 5, verses 21, 22. Um, I'll just read 21. After Jesus crossed over by a boat, a large crowd met him at the seaside. One of the meeting place leaders named Jairus came. Okay? One of the meeting place leaders named Jairus came. Now, it may have been that I was tired, but I'm sure I read in one of my studies somewhere. <laughs> and I want you to go and check this out and come back to me and say, you were wrong. Okay? <laughs> Because then at least I'll know you've looked at it and not just believed me word for word, okay? I am sure I read somewhere that this is the same meeting place that the Roman captain built. Right? Now I might be wrong. If I'm wrong online, community, I'm sure you'll tell me. <laughs> but <laughs> so here's a thought. Here's a thought. If the Roman captain, Centur the Roman, uh, captain sent a group of Jewish leaders from the Jewish community, and they were the ones that said, come on Jesus, this man built our meeting place, could it not be possible that Jairus was one of the people that was sent to Jesus in that first occasion? Possibly. <clears throat> Possibly. Because it says, one of the meeting place leaders named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his knees beside himself as he begged, My dear daughter is at death's door. You see, if he'd been one of that group that had gone, um, uh, to the Roman captain uh, had been sent by, um, then he'd have seen and recognised how Jesus works. He'd have seen that actually, that even by being out of the, the town, Jesus could still perform the miracle. And some faith in him must have stirred because his daughter was now very ill. Who was he going to turn to? Jesus was in town. Why not go to Jesus? But unlike the Roman captain, he went. He was desperate. And it says that he begged. He fell to his knees and he begged. But in faith, what does he say? Because his daughter at this time is not dead. Remember that. She's only poorly. He says, come and lay hands on her so she will get well and live. That's faith. That's faith. He was so desperate that Jairus went out and he got on his knees and he begged Jesus to turn this situation around. It says Jesus went with him, the whole crowd tagging along, pushing and jostling him. <clears throat> no wonder Jesus was always tired at the end of the day, <laughs> after yesterday's party. <laughs> God dear, I was in bed by nine. <laughs> there we meet. So Jesus had this huge crowd tagging along, pushing, jostling, then we come to this other story, and I want us to read it because, again, faith is so important here. It says, a woman who had suffered a condition of hemorrhaging for 12 years, 12 years, remember that, 
A long succession of physicians had treated her and treated her badly, taking all her money and leaving her worse off than before. Had heard about Jesus, she slipped in from behind and touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can put a finger on his robe, I can get well. That's faith too. Yeah. So you've got these two characters, both at the same time, with such tremendous faith, Jairus and this woman. If I can put a finger on his robe, I can get well. The moment she did it, the flow of blood dried up. She could feel the change and knew her plague was over and done with. At the same moment, Jesus felt energy discharging from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said, What are you talking about? With this crowd pushing and jostling you, you're asking who touched me? Dozens have touched you. But he went on asking, looking around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened, knowing she was the one, stepped up in fear and trembling, knelt before him and gave him the whole story. Amen. Jesus said to her, daughter. The readings I've done suggest that it's the only time Jesus calls a woman daughter. What a title to give. It just, it was the right word at the right time. She was on her knees, trembling in fear. What had she done? She was healed. She could feel she was better, but... And Jesus, in an instant, with one word, says, Daughter, you took a risk of faith, and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your faith. So in the three accounts of Jairus coming up to Jesus, him pleading with Jesus to come back to my house, my daughter is sick. They're on the way back and then suddenly there's this other person who takes a risk of faith that says, this is my moment, He's, Jesus is passing and I am not going to miss this opportunity. She touches the robe and is healed instantly. The Bible goes on. It says, while he was still talking, some people came from the leader's house and told him, your daughter is dead. Now, <clears throat> just thinking about that, because how we get told someone's died, you know, here, here is Jairus with the big crowd, and someone turns up, it, it, usually you'd think, perhaps they'd take them up to one side and say, oh, your daughter's died. It suggests actually they just went straight up to him and said, ah, your daughter is dead. Some translations and commentaries I've read, it says uh, the Greek translated where dead is the first word. Dead is your daughter. Lovely. <laughs> just what he wanted to hear. So suddenly this has totally changed. He was hoping that Jesus would come and heal his daughter. And now suddenly his daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus overheard what they were talking about and said to the leader, don't listen to them, just trust me. He permitted no one to go in with him except Peter, James and John. Three people, in fact there were two others that went in with Jesus as well. We'll read that in a second. I think. Peter, James and John, close disciples that Jesus took in certain places. So again, John was there. He saw, he was privy to what very few people had seen. They entered the leader's house and pushed their way through the gossips looking for a story and this is one of my favourite translations from uh, Eugene Peterson. <laughs> I love how he does this. So they, Jesus is pushing his way through the house, through the gossips, looking for a story, because there's always plenty of those, even on sad occasions. And this is the bit I love the best. Neighbours bringing in casseroles. 
just what you want. Yeah, they mean well, but actually I found that you just need your own space, don't you? Actually, it would be far better if the casserole was just left at the door. They didn't knock at the door. I remember, right, I can't, I can't tell that. I can't tell the story, actually. We need to turn it off for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can say it the after. Well, uh, <coughs> yeah, I'll tell it in the after. <laughs> Actually, my experience has been that you just don't want people around you. But you do. You want the right people that will just actually just sit with you and not say a word. Because you know that their very presence is just a comfort at that time. So they mean well, but actually what happened in that time was that they could hire people to come and start wailing outside their door to show people that something terrible had happened. So the wailers were in. Uh, they were wailing. The casserole makers had already turned on the, off the slow cooker. They got the pot ready and they were bringing it round. <clears throat> and it says Jesus was abrupt. I like that. People accuse me of being abrupt at times. Well, if Jesus can be abrupt, so can I. <laughs> With all this busybody grief and gossip, why all this busybody grief and go gossip? This child isn't dead. She's sleeping. Mm. Now, here comes part of the problem with this story. Was the daughter just sleeping? You see, the people that came to Jairus uh, initially said that the daughter was dead. So in my book, she's dead. She's died. She's breathed her last. And they knew it, so they've gone to tell Jairus. But of course, Jesus is talking about something else. And they hadn't quite grasped it, I think. The child isn't dead, she's sleeping. Provoked to sarcasm, they told him he didn't know what he was talking about. But when he had sent them all out, listen, he took the child's father and mother. Isn't it strange how so often in the, not just the gospel accounts, but in the Bible accounts, the women aren't named. And here again, the mother who must have been just distraught. Uh, is not named, but Jairus is. Along with his companions, and they entered the child's room, he clasped the girl's hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Well, I remember doing Mark's Gospel in, uh, at school for O-Level, and I think it was at that moment when I read that that I realised that Jesus wasn't English. <laughs> I know it's enlightening and I know you all but actually I suddenly realised what? wait he spoke a different language yeah he did he wasn't English Jesus spoke a different language to us Talitha Kum which means little girl get up notice the similarities what did he say to the son at name? Just a uh, son, get up. A child, get up. Simple, uh, authoritative word. At that, she was up and walking around. Now listen, this girl was how old? Twelve. Twelve. So isn't it interesting that the Bible threads these two stories in all the Gospel accounts? For twelve years, this woman had suffered terribly with bleeding. Terribly. And for those 12 years, Jairus had raised up his daughter, probably the love of his life. And on this day, the two of them come together to Jesus. Just really interesting, I think. I, I, and as I've done this study the, uh, for this week, I, maybe I'd seen it before, but... It was like a light being switched on this week. I thought, wow. And isn't it strange because Jairus gets there first and he's 
probably dragging Jesus back. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, Jesus. My daughter's not very well. Come on, you need to get there quick. And as they're moving along, what happens? This other person suddenly grasps the moment, touches the road, and there is healing instantly. Suddenly, the whole crowd stops. Jairus must be thinking, come on, come on, my daughter is ill. Come on, Jesus, I need you. I know it sounds selfish, but we need, sometimes we are selfish when we are pleading at rock bottom, when we're in desperate need. We're not bothered about what other people's problems are. We're only bothered about our problems. And the Bible shows that clearly. These two characters were there with Jesus at the very same time, demanding his attention, demanding his healing. And they both got it. Wow. And so Jesus, this healing of this woman takes place and Jesus comes back to the house. But of course the girl has since died. She was 12 years old. Now, we're going to look, try and look up. Um, 12 is about power and authority. Power and authority. Wow. Because we, we did this, because I had so much preparation time for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> when the Bible mentions numbers, it's for a reason. So 12 is about God's, God's perfect power, power and authority. God's perfect power and authority. Wow. Makes sense now, doesn't it? But she had to, the, the woman had had to suffer terribly for 12 years. Just remember that. But in an instant, she was healed. It says to finish, they were, of course, were all beside themselves with joy. He gave them strict orders that no one was to know what had taken place in that room. Now, here's my thought about why, why John didn't put this account in his gospel because Jesus had told him not to. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Because it's, it's an amazing story, is it not? It should produce in us some amazing faith that says, wow, these two people, God's perfect power and authority. I might have to wait a little bit, but God's in control. God's got this. Yeah. So sometimes the, the gospel writers and Jesus says some really strange things. And this is one of them. No one was to know what had taken place in that room. Now, I remember Lisa telling me, don't you ever tell me not to do something. <laughs> because what's the one thing that they will go and do? They'll go and do it. Now, was Jesus telling them that? For that reason, because he knew that actually by saying, don't tell anyone, it would be the very thing they would go and do. Maybe it was that. I don't know. But again, don't tell me that Jesus doesn't care, because the very last thing he says is, give her something to eat. In all this, as we, as we grasp some difficult things... Let's remember that Jesus does care. Scripture tells us he does. That's in his nature. God loves us undeservedly. We don't deserve any of his love, but he loves us, as Mandy shared uh, before I came up to talk. He loves, someone in this room really needs to know, we all need to know, God really loves us. He loves you undeservedly. So, I'm going to finish by trying to impress Daisy. <laughs> uh, and it probably will fail miserably. But um, I'm trying to bring that. So, it's a difficult uh, topic. Death, suffering, but that. It's a topic that we need to start to grasp, I think, because the Bible does provide us with some responses that are helpful. I've been reading a book uh, by uh, Tim Keller. I know what you're going to say. Yeah, it's all Tim Keller. It's all Tim Keller at the minute. Yeah, that's because he's, he, what he writes is good stuff. 
Um, I was reading a book in readiness for next week's talk about Lazarus. Um, and then he, I came across this little passage. It's about, uh, it, it says it like this, in Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Are you impressed? <laughs> Have you read this book? <laughs> I, I'll tell you a story. I, uh, in my uh, college days at Lincoln, we did a uh, study on Macbeth. And at, as a result of that study on Macbeth, which I really like actually, somehow uh, there came this discussion or, or recommendation that if you liked Macbeth, you would like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Oh, I thought, hmm, I could look intelligent here. I think I'll go and try and find it out. Well, Macbeth, of course, is only a pretty short book. <coughs> I did find Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. It was in the works. I remember buying it, 99p. I thought, fuck it. Don't even have to spend a lot of money. Um, <coughs> what I didn't know was that classic novels were just not my thing. Not my thing at all. No pictures. <laughs> small words, small words, crikey. I mean, the book was about that thick. Every page was just really small words. I could, it took me about half an hour to read page one. By page one, I thought, I think I'm gonna just give in. <laughs> None of it was making sense. It was just, oh, oh dear. So I'm in awe of anyone that can read those big books, but anyway. <laughs> Bear with me on this, because it says, in the brothers Karamazov, I don't know if I said that right, but there is a scene in which two people are talking about suffering. Ivan Karamazov is talking about there being any possibility that we can make sense of suffering. And here's what he says. I'll just paraphrase it a bit. I believe, like a child, that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Then he goes on. That in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, of all the blood that they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. Dostoevsky's Christianity, surging through his imagination and craft, he says that he believes that at the end, the reality will be so astonishing, the joy will be so incredible, the fulfillment will be so amazing that the most miserable life will feel like one night in a bad hotel. It's a mystery. You might be going through some really difficult stuff. You might. But know this, that in the mystery of eternity, what you're going through, because of what Jesus did on the cross, his blood, it will feel in eternity like one night in a bad hotel. Difficult stuff. But if we have faith, if we come to terms and start to question the great mysteries of life, then we will find that in Jesus Christ, we can find some real answers Amen. to those difficult things.